Well, thank you for coming. Uh, this is the first of the uh, teaching and technology series for the semester, and uh, I think we have a great lineup. So I hope after today you'll keep coming back. We'll have one another another one in about two weeks, and then two more in March. Actually, three more in March. And so uh, today we have Tom Harmon, who's going to be um, talking about clickers, and uh, he'll actually do a demonstration. I see it on these little things. So. Hopefully it'll um, give you some insight as to how you can use it in your classes or help others in theirs, because I know that uh, there's been an interest recently and, um, and there hasn't really been any kind of concerted effort as, as a university to kind of promote this. And so hopefully after today's presentation, uh, and we're also going to record it and podcast it for those who can't make it today and they can hopefully uh, get a sense of how this can be used. So uh, without any further ado, Tom Harmon. Thanks, Mike. Uh, so, welcome everyone. I'm a, a, in the School of Engineering and um, started using these things about uh, four years ago. And um, I'll try to tell you why I did it and a little bit about what I've done with them, what I haven't done, but that might be cool, that sort of thing in, in a fairly informal presentation. So, I, 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 I only have about 15 slides, and so I really want this to be uh, more interactive. Um, I usually use them in the fall, which is, a, is the time I teach my big gen ed course. Um, I've used them a little bit in a small engineering course, but those courses are kind of small enough that you don't really need them, I don't think. Um, the, the big value I find for them is that they sort of break down the interaction barrier by allowing the students to be a little bit more interactive while remaining anonymous, so they don't have to raise their hand and, and respond in front of all their peers, which I found uh, particularly at the freshman and sophomore level can be a little bit daunting sometimes in a big, in your first big, big classroom setting. Uh, anyway, so I used it in the fall, and since that time I have a new laptop with a new operating system, and I upgraded the uh, the software, and uh, I learned to my chagrin last night that in doing that, that my new software no no longer likes the receiver, um, so it I have to. Uh, I've, I've, Ask permission from the company to send me an upgrade for the for the hardware. In the meantime, uh, the hardware will only take five inputs, so I, that's why I only brought five five clickers. So they're they're keeping me on. So you guys can maybe uh, uh, pass these around, and, and at different points of the talk, you'll get to answer some questions and and click in. And I apologize for that unforeseen. So is that just with Vista? It's hard. just uh, with their 2008 version of their software, apparently, Okay. I, mean, I don't know, it seemed a little bit like a uh, reason to get another couple bucks out of me to update the... Jordan's actually wanting to get, we just got some of these receivers. Okay. Because we're, we hope to have this in a lot of classrooms. Okay. So he's actually going to bring one and see if it works for you. Okay. But I don't have any more clickers. Right. So, <laughs> I, have, I own 50 of them, and that, that usually gets me, gets, just about gets me in, in the class. Uh, this is, this is uh, one of the receivers, which is just USB, quite easy, just plug it in and, and uh, works, works great. It uh, has things that have pretty good range. Uh, I've used it in the big classrooms of this building, and you know, 100 feet away seems to be no problem. So uh, the name of this stuff, as you can see on there, is called uh, Turning Point Technologies. And what this company has done is uh, create a, a software that, uh, that, in, that inter intimately weaves right into PowerPoint. It's built to work with PowerPoint. So you'll see as I fire it up here, here's the icon for Turning Point. And I just double click it. And you saw the, uh, with your quick eyes, you saw the PowerPoint icon click up there because it's actually starting up PowerPoint and putting itself inside PowerPoint. This was messing around with it last night. As you can imagine, this is uh, this takes a little bit of some some nifty coding. This is the message I got that said my receiver is not licensed to work with the current version. But it does work for five at least of them. So um, as you see it looks like you're in PowerPoint here. Um, but you've got one more tab up on the menu now. It's called Turning Point. And this this is uh, this is a new look for the software, so I'm, I might be a little bit uh, clunky today. But um, I 
find that uh, likes to uh, likes to start off with the receiver. So little asides that I can throw in along the way, over the last four years, um, software's gotten a lot smarter about recognizing its receiver. The first year I taught it, um, if I forgot to put the receiver in before I started up the software, I would never find it. I'd have to shut down, put it in, restart, get everything going. Now it, now it seems a little smarter. It doesn't matter so much. Uh, so they've worked that out a little bit. Uh, before, it was a little difficult to find your way around in Turning Point. It was kind of hidden in, in PowerPoint. It wasn't a big problem after you spent a couple of weeks with it. But now, it, it, as you can see, it's much more sort of seamlessly put in there like it really belongs in there. So as you recall from the uh, flyer, we're going to talk about uh, catalyzing class interactions here with these clickers or audience, audience response uh, systems, the good, the bad, and the RFID. So here's what I'll try to get through pretty quickly today. Uh, why I started with these things, uh, how they work, what I have done with them. But I haven't tried, but I'd like to. It, it's just the tip of the iceberg of what I've done. Uh, as you'll see, these things actually, the software actually uh, maintains all the data that you're collecting through the course of the classroom. And, and, and you, at the end, when you quit PowerPoint, it'll say, do you want to save this session? It's asking you if you want to retain all the responses that you've got. And then you can go in later and generate all kinds of reports, you know, who answered quickly, who answered slowly, who answered incorrectly, correctly or the statistics. Uh, if you got clever enough, uh, you'll notice I wrote a marker, a number on those things. Um, I actually uh, marry a student to a clicker, so I know who they are. Not sure if that's uh, I'm probably violating some human subject act, but let's just <laughs> keep that between us. And uh, you know, it's nice because it gives me, if nothing else, it gives me a very quick and free attendance for my class. Um, but. Uh, if you were to uh, put down some data about demographics of those students, you'd be able to do some slicing and dicing of the data pretty easily. Do I ever have time to do any of that? No, I really usually don't. But uh, I'll show you what I have done and, and see what you think. So if we start off here uh, with a quick question and see if our new response meter works. Uh, why are you here today? Because you're interested in learning how these work? You were hoping to find a free lunch. Uh, you already know how they work, but you want to watch Carmen fumble with them. <laughs> you know what I didn't do? So this is, I have to reset the whole session. Mm -hmm. so I was practicing uh, whether it worked last night. So I had, a, I had kind of a startup session last night to make sure everything was working. And it, how much, how what, channel what channel are you using? Go to tools, setup or settings, yeah. Response device. Forty. Okay. Thank you. So, um, as you can see, you have to tell uh, these little clickers which uh, channel you have them on, and they were working on mine last night, so I never bothered to check, but. Um, do you remember how you set them? Yeah, hit the go button so the LED go. is flashing. Yeah. And then four zero, and then just wait. And go. And go. And go. Yeah. So you go. go again? Yeah. So go, four zero, go. So typically in your first class, you would pass these out. You would say, uh, you know, you are now, you are now number clicker 11. And every class, I want you to take clicker 11. So I have them in the table in front of the class. The kids walk in, they pick their hand up out, they pick their clicker out. And then uh, I've only lost one in three semesters with a big yeah. class. So they, they do give them back usually, and, uh, and they don't lose them. Um, when you say big class, what's big? For me, it's about 50. Yeah. That's the biggest I've done. Um, but I'm in the engineering school, so I'm used to small classes. Um, 
Um, so this is uh, uh, so the first thing you would do then is you would do throw up uh, throw uh, um, you tell everybody to hit go uh, 40 go if we're going to use channel 40. And you could do that all ahead of time, which is what I did when I was worried about it the first semester. But it's kind of tedious. You got this stack of clickers and you're going through them. Okay, so. Okay, so polling is open. Uh, see if there's some responses coming in. We should have, you can see up on top, you can either watch that for yourself or as I'll show you in a couple of slides, you can set up a timer where they'll actually have 10 seconds or 15 seconds and I'll watch the clock going down if you want to build a little bit of uh, drama in your class. They, they, uh, they seem to enjoy that a bit. And then you would get your responses popped up in, you know, right, right in that time. It says we had three answers and one person was interested and two wanted to watch me fumble. <laughs> Which I just did. So, my history. So, the, the class I teach is called, is a gen ed course called the Environment in Crisis. Uh, and um, this is for um, basically Shaw students who need to take some science, lower division science, science units. Um, but don't really want to take organic chemistry, <laughs> something like that. And so uh, it's a semester-long course. Uh, it has a lecture component. It has a laboratory component. And it's, uh, it's a course that tries to talk about the interface between policy and science. So it, would, uh, it begs for some discussion and some interaction and some controversial topics. So it's kind of hard to do with 40 or 50 people in the room. So I thought that... Uh, one, this was a new type of class for me. Uh, I hardly ever, uh, uh, coming to Merced, I came from UCLA, I never really taught freshmen and sophomores except maybe an occasional freshman seminar. Uh, I uh, didn't have big classes because by the time when you were junior and senior in engineering, your classes are usually maybe 15 people, 20 people maybe. And uh, I knew that this student that was in here was not typically going to be keen on science. Uh, and, and so uh, there are some exceptions to that, but for the most part, uh, I found that you know out of this 50 students, about a third of them are pretty keen on it. A third of them are about neutral, and about a third of them may or may not show up for class. So they're <laughs> not so keen on it. Uh, so, and given all this, um, uh, I'm getting older here in life. How do I uh, how do I hold the attention of an 18 year old in this day and age? So I think uh, most of us have uh, probably felt this uh, this way, where you're uh, sitting in a class and you're giving a lecture and you think it's pretty good stuff, but five or ten minutes into the class, it's just glazed over, and these people are just it could be anywhere. Nothing is getting through to them. So uh, this is why I really started the class. Uh, I really wanted to be able to interact with them. I'm uh, you know, fairly, having gone through an engineering curriculum and been an engineer all my life, I'm actually fairly introverted myself. I'm not the most, the greatest facilitator at drawing people out and trying to make them uh, discuss things in class. So this was a way for both of us to kind of break down this barrier and get responses. I can tease responses out of the audience. I'm getting pretty good at putting questions up that are uh, sort of on a controversial note and either knowing what they're going to answer or being surprised by what they answer. But either way, I have something to launch a discussion point with. So when they don't have to uh, talk, they don't talk. They just, they just shoot. <laughs> So sometimes I just put in things that are kind of random opinions. What would you think of a 10% pay cut to help out California? We'd gladly do it, we'd go along with it, but protest, you would accept it, and would not accept it and would seek another employment or you would volunteer for 20%. Uh,
just build a slide, you know, and then you'll see how, how easy it is to put it together. So uh, how do these things work? Well, you've got your uh, your uh, clicker, or your uh, sender, and then your receiver. And the software uh, is uh, wired up with your license to know how many receivers you're able to handle. I assume that won't be a problem if the campus starts gets a site license or sort of thing. Um, right now, I'm licensed for 50 or was licensed for 50, now I'm licensed for five. <laughs> um, it should be should be no problem. Yeah, no, there shouldn't be any any limitations. Necessary. So, uh, so um, you basically, you install the software. Like I said, it's gotten much better. Um, uh, Mac and PC versions are, are available, and I'll tell you a little more about that in a second. I've used both. Um, uh, you initialize the RF transmitters like we just did. And uh, then if you want to take one more step, and you don't need to do this, but if you want to know who's holding your clicker, you have to tie the, um, the identification number of the clicker into the, into the list of clickers. And then you can sort them into groups. Uh, I've, made, I've done it to do things like quiz meets where I have teams of students and I have to make sure that all their clicker scores get added into their total. And that's a, a really nice um, commodity. So the software integrates with PowerPoint uh, seamlessly. I would used to put that in quotes, but now it's uh, now it's uh, pretty good. Uh, in 2004, it was a little buggy on Windows; it would crash a lot. Uh, the report generating thing was just really wacky and hard to figure out, not intuitive at all. And uh, Mac OS, it wasn't really existent then. Then uh, two years later, uh, pretty good on Windows. Uh, Workable but buggy on the Mac with sort of a reduced number of features. And now um, very stable on Windows and better on the Mac operating system, getting to be more and more. So sort of kind of paralleling the whole Microsoft Office suite that's kind of come together and there's less and less compatibility issues. Uh, so uh, it's quite a new version now and I'm just getting used to it because like most uh, professors, I will you know, hold on to a software to the bloody end before I upgrade, and I now just finally got forced into upgrading. So let's try. Uh, let's try to make a slide here. Quite simple. Uh, you remember, you open up Turning Point. So you're sitting in PowerPoint, but you're in the Turning Point enabled version of PowerPoint. If you're just sitting in PowerPoint, you won't be able to see any of these options. You're uh, maybe you know maybe you're just you just open it up. And you say, okay, well, I want to put in a slide with a question. So I click on the turning point tab, and now you see this new set of icons up here. And this one, the, the common one you would say is, I, well, I want to insert a slide, and I want it to be a question. There's all kinds of ways you can make the questions. Uh, you can make them multiple choice or true false. Uh, they have, I haven't really used it, but you can have essay slides and stuff there. I'm not sure. I'm not even sure what you would do with the essay slide. Um, and then it looks like uh, stuff I haven't seen before, but they haven't made it. They've made it easier to uh, show who's on what team and how the teams are scoring during the course of things. I, I tell you, one of the most popular things I do is, is before a midterm or before a final, I'll take half a class and I'll dedicate it to a quiz meet that's based on uh, questions that may be on the exam. Uh, sort of a safe competition mode. They really seem to enjoy that and they seem to rise to the occasion and they want to win. Especially if I, well, if I put like 10 extra credit points on the table, uh, <laughs> I can whip them into a frenzy. <laughs> so let's just uh, say, okay, let's uh, go with the vertical slide. And, and basically, if you've worked a lot with PowerPoint, you realize that it's just running around in there and putting in some special animations that you could uh, you can kind of build yourself if you have lots of time. But it's putting in a, a, a chart and the question and some answers. And as you, you'll put this question in, and then as you begin to populate answers, it'll put more bars on the chart. So you could say, uh, who is the UCM chancellor? Steve K or Carol TK. 
Day or uh, Jeff Wright. And you see that it, it's smart enough to know I, I now have four answers there, so it should have four bars. Um, some reason that it sort of sets them at some equal level to begin with. So um, if you were going to use this right away, you'd say, okay, let's just reset this slide. Careful not to reset the whole session because that would wipe out that data I just collected. Uh, but if you just reset the current slide, it puts everything down to zero. Uh, and um, did add some bells and whistles then. It's ready to go right now. It'll come up and you'll be in control of when they start and when they stop. But if you want to add some bells and whistles, you go to insert object. You say, let's do a, let's do a countdown. And you put a little hourglass icon in. Make it a little bigger if you want. And so this guy will start counting down from 10 uh, when you, um, when you hit the click, let's try to fire this up. And so the polling opens, and if uh, it's open now, so people can respond, but if I hit the next button, you're on the clock, and you're gonna get locked out of responding if you don't respond quickly enough. Will you change something if I press the right answer several times? Uh, this it, is the same, same I, I think what, it, it grabs the first answer that registers, and, and then you're done. You think so? In the settings, you can change how many oh. times they're allowed to change their answer. Okay, well, that'd be interesting. <laughs> so, um, one thing you can do is you can you don't you can um, uh, assign you can well you should you should go in and you can tell the software which answer is right. Uh, you can maybe have different gradations of right and assign different levels of points to those answers. And you can also have it uh, downscale, downgrade the points with the timing so that speed, speed would help win the day if somebody both, if two people answered the same question correctly. So it, it, it can be kind of fun. Wow, I'll be happy to hear that. <laughs> So what, are, what have I tried to do? Um, like I said, I've really only scratched the surface. It, it would be fun if I had more time to, to play around with it, but what I do with them is I have what I call intra-lecture review questions, meaning that in the same lecture, I'll circle back to points I made, and I'm just sort of teasing them, kind of like a you know foreign language learning tape. You know, you talk about good morning, good afternoon, then you go talk about buying something at the store, and then you say, how do you say good morning? You know, you kind of circle back, and it causes the brain to jump around a little bit, and it helps supposedly with the retention. It also lets me know who's paying attention, and, and, and it often tells me uh, on some complicated points that I did not cover the point well, because I'll just see answers all over the map on a question that should be straightforward if I presented it pretty well. So that can be pretty nice. Uh, it's really kind of eliminated me walking back to my class, back, back to my office, trying to remember that next lecture I have to go back to that point because I can tell I didn't get it. I can fix things right away, kind of. Uh, then enter lecture uh, quest, review questions. So then I might circle back to something from a couple lectures ago. And then you really start to get a feel for who's on the ball and who's, who's struggling to keep up. Uh, the third one, which I didn't really notice until recently, was, was it's really powerful for me to vet possible exam questions, where I do have a lot of multiple choice questions with such a big class. You know, we have essay questions and a little bit of problem solving too, but it's kind of a nightmare to grade for 50 papers. So we use a lot of multiple choice as well. And you know, like everybody, sometimes I make them up and they seem great, but then only you know 10% of the class gets it right, and you go back and you read it and you realize it's ambiguously worded and things like that. So uh, this way, uh, I, I I really do um, get get embedded well, and um, and the students also will quickly you know they're very adaptive animals. They realize that some of the questions from the clickers are appearing on the exams, um, you know, and. And some of that last third of the class that doesn't tend to come to class very much starts to show up a little more. So I mean, whatever it takes, I think, in some, some regards. 
as I said, some of the really fun things have been the quiz meets. The students really like that. Uh, I also do just some broadening information uh, outside the typical scope of the class, but an interesting co connection, you know. Uh, and I'll show you an example of that. And, and with the clickers, it doesn't cost so much time. The clickers kind of keep me on a leash so I don't drift off on a big tangent. Yet they plant a connection between, say, some environmental problem that they're sort of familiar with, with a time in history and who was in office at that time and what was going on. And sometimes, uh, I've cut, cut myself off with some words here, but sometimes I just put in random humorous questions to provide a little comic relief or transition between topics in the class. So, for example, uh, I may have been in the context of a fossil fuel related lecture, and these are Shaw students, some of them political science students, so they like a little bit of connections. And I might ask something like, who were the U.S. presidents during the previous oil crises of uh, 1973 and 1979. Sometimes it's hard for me to think back in the timeline and get these things right, too. So it's good to ward off Alzheimer's and things like that. <laughs> so you notice the little, this is the little bar on the bottom uh, where I, I would actually have an indicator of how many people out of the class have answered. And here, of course, only five people have clickers, so we're not going to get any further than that. But you get to see how people are doing. All right, guys, we're getting serious now. <laughs> <laughs> how do you insert that on the bottom? That That's another insert object. Another insert object. Yeah. Okay. And another insert object that you can do, which is fairly important, they'll go crazy if you don't do it, is the, uh, is the correct answer yeah. indicator. They don't like that when you don't tell them. <laughs> But I do tease them, the handouts that I put on the web uh, on crops before class uh, don't have the answer on them. <laughs> and, um, and so if they want the answers, they either have to have a friend in class or come to class. Mm -hmm. Do you require your students to answer all the questions, or if they choose not to, that's okay? They don't have to answer them. Um, I, um, I do randomly uh, sample the answers from various classes in, in part. I have, a, I have sort of a, a rinky-dink attendance participation part of the class. And so I will see, usually if a person's missed like more than 20% of the class, I would tend not to be so lenient on that part of the grade. But I don't look to see if they answered every question. It's a time issue probably more than anything. I mean, I'd like to see, uh, I would like to comb through the data and see if there's correlations between how accurate they are in class with how well they do on exams. All these kinds of things would be quite easy to tease out with a few extra hours. So this in the same lecture, I might ask something about our former president, I should have changed that slide, former president Bush, energy obtained from fission uh, is atomic energy, nuclear energy, Texas lightning in a model, or just like the unit. <laughs> And uh, that one, the correct is nuclear. <laughs> and I usually have a follow-up question about how, when, how the only uh, when we had a trained engineer as a president, Jimmy Carter, I have the same question, and it's the same answer, unfortunately, because he <laughs> pronounces it nuclear. Even though he's a nuclear engineer. <laughs> Something about the South, I guess. So, are they useful? Um, I think anecdotally, they do seem to keep the class more awake and active. Um, I, the first time I taught this class, I taught it in the California room uh, back before you know this this building was open and stuff. And I taught it at eight in the morning because I'm uh, that's, I'm just like I want to get up and get things going, which was you know they'd roll in in their pajamas and sweats and <laughs> complain to the whole thing. So so I relaxed and I moved it till nine, uh, which they still don't like. But they are, uh, they are, it does keep them a little bit of motion and, and awakeness here. Uh, but really, I do notice that uh, I meet, if I've immediately missed a point or committed it poorly, uh, I'm betting on the test questions. And, and as I said, at the very least, I get a, a instantaneous uh, 
uh, attendance without having a call roll or have people sign in or something tedious and time consuming like that. So uh, we can make another slide and uh, You see this, this menu that popped up when I'm making a slide. Um, as I put down answers, more blocks will appear. And I'll be able to assign either a correctness or points to that answer if I want to go with a point system. So, uh, Here, you have four questions. You could say that uh, you could either just go with correct or incorrect, or we could set a point value here, and not so much. We'll just get that zero points. <laughs> and uh, this one will give uh, 10 points. They do, you know, a semester is a long time. I won't say that, you know, I think the luster wears off after about eight or nine weeks. And I probably start to use them a little less toward the end. And they even mention them on like the end of the year evaluation that you know of? Yeah, they, they, some, the ones who like them do. I haven't had, but not everybody mentions them. So that's how you didn't reset the slide, but it still in the new version, if there's no session data for oh, the current course. slide, it'll uh, assume you have none and just go with it. That's, okay. that's good. I didn't notice that. That's good to catch. They, I mean, it's been they've been working on it for five or six years now, I guess. So I guess they're starting to really figure out some of the rough edges that were there before. So I was thinking a little bit over the last couple of days of, of things I'd like to try but haven't had time. Of course, this gets complicated, but if you wanted to maybe write something about these results in, in some of the educational journals, um, you know, how do they really enhance learning? Do they really enhance learning and how? Uh, is, is more material covered uh, yet uh, without flooding the students? Um, do they retain it better because you're getting this kind of quick and easy repetition that's not so painful. Uh, deeper understanding, I don't know, that would, you know, that would be hard to tease out, um, but are, are these little add-ons, uh, connections to policy, connections to economics that normally you didn't have in a class, but now you're sprinkling them in there because it's basically free on your time, is that helping? And, and why, you know, uh, why is this happening? Is this, is this facilitating some semblance of active learning where the students are kind of participating a little more and not just sitting there passively receiving the information or, or not. Uh, some of the some big questions, you know, how would it be beneficial for the students to what if the students were to look at the session reports, you know, if you had some sort of uh, I don't know if that's probably probably illegal, but uh, 
in some way of uh, uh, letting uh, them see who they were, but keeping everyone else anonymous would probably be okay. But it might wake some of them up to see, wow, I'm, I, I get, how come I get every answer wrong yet? 60% of the class always gets everything right. Maybe I should read that chapter before I come to class, that sort of thing. But, uh, it's difficult to do a truly controlled experiment. I don't know if you, uh, uh, I did do some uh, work with technology in the classroom in the late 90s, and, and uh, I was working with some, some education assessment people, and you know, it's, it's, it's hard to have one session of a class that uses the technology and the other class doesn't, because they talk and they all want to use it. And, uh, and then uh, how do you teach those two sessions uh, exactly the same so that everything else is, the only thing different is the clickers. And uh, you know, I guess I might, Maybe the closest thing I could do is uh, just not use the clickers one year and see how, how the outcomes uh, occur. Because I do more or less teach it the same way every year. My time has gotten kind of so constrained that I, I just get in there and do it kind of the same way every year, unfortunately. So anyway, this is uh, some things I think about from time to time. They are uh, uh, a lot cleaner than uh, trying to make the kids sit down and take a survey and that sort of thing. You can make them go through a survey pretty quick with these things. So, uh, more questions, comments, or we could talk about some of the uh, deeper things these can do. Um, sounds like we got someone who's been looking into them a little bit lately. Oh, uh, Todd and I are actually working very closely with the vendor. Um, we're trying to make this the campus solution. Um, we've tried using HIT before, didn't go so well. It's, yeah, one of the bulky things, yeah. infrared receivers is there. Um, what was the problem with that? Uh, mainly infrared, because the fluorescent lights give off infrared radiation, uh -huh. and it would actually eat the clicker signal before it ever got to the receiver. So uh -huh. there's that, that they can't take as many at once. Right. It's RFID, you click and it records it. You, it could only receive so many clicks at once, so you had to leave your question up a much yeah. longer. Um, I think the biggest one, though, was the, the, the software. software. Yeah, it was the cheapest route for the students. The clickers were the cheapest, and it was something that one of the other UCs had gone full bore. All their classrooms had it. And, you know, at the time we were opening, it was you know who's going to be able to support us, and if they've done the work um, to investigate it. So, um, but it definitely they didn't keep up. Whereas Turning Point has really been you know, it, and, and improving their product year after year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, 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 they do seem to be, um, I just kind of stumbled on them, and they do seem to be getting better and better. And well, to uh, kind of put some perspective on it, I went to Infocom, which is an audiovisual conference in 2007, and there were five clicker vendors there. And when I went in 2008, there were two. <laughs> and it was Turning Point and... I thought they were the only one. No, iClicker was there, but they weren't there. Like, they were on the program guide, but they weren't there. So, um, so they're definitely kind of starting to stand out as one of the leaders in this technology area. And we were not just basing it off the fact that you were willing to stick with it for, for four years, but um, <laughs> we got, I mean, we listened to the, the core faculty, core, core one committee wanted, spe had specific needs, and so we, we looked at the different technologies to try to meet their needs as well as some of the frustrations that other instructors had had with the past system. So yeah. we yeah. felt like it was a relief. Seems like the core one, you could really collect a lot. Interesting information about the whole class passing through that gate. Yeah, and Turning um, is really interested actually in getting prop support or Sakai support because they have Blackboard and WebCT, um, but they haven't really found a site that is flexible enough to work with them on Sakai. But we said we might be interested in partnering with them to develop it so you can actually import your grade book directly through the software as opposed to. I mean, do it manually, but that said, we have put together a system where people, students can go register their clicker IDs, and then faculty can just download an Excel spreadsheet that has their clicker ID, their student information. Yeah, that's nice, because that's a little tedious to make yeah, sure. Yeah, that, that, yeah. Yeah. that way you won't have to worry about managing the clickers. Yeah. They just walk in with them. And right. So that, that's a little easier. So you'll have an instant roster that you can import and have associated with your session data whenever you do the class. It does take about three or four weeks for, for everyone to remember their number. Yeah. <laughs> I have two questions for you. The first is, I was surprised that you said that you would go faster with 
the clickers, I imagine that you would cover less material because you'd be waiting for students to respond and getting everybody to respond versus just that one person that always knows the answer raises their hand. And then, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I was more in the situation where no one would raise their hand because of, and um, it just like, uh, and uh, I figure it usually you get a little rhythm going and it's only a 10 second timer and um, uh, it just tends to, uh, tends to move things along and pace me through the lecture pretty well. Okay. And, and, I, I, then I was curious about the, you kept talking about human subjects issues and about collecting their names and data, and um, I mean, is there an issue? I mean, should we be worried about that? And then, because I mean, I have, I do have my students paired with it, and yeah. and I wanted to also collect demographic information on them <laughs> to see. I mean, just basic stuff. Not I think religion, I think but, if you keep them anonymous, I'm not an expert on this, but I, okay. if, but but if you are going to publish stuff, oh, no, you, you, yeah. you're basically abusing them for an experiment, then they they have to sign off on that, mm -hmm. um, and, you, and you have to be. Yeah. But I mean, besides it's not even publishing, is there, I mean, does the, I mean, is there a, do we have a policy on sort of information we can collect from students? Not uh, even like terms of publication, but just. In that, in that respect, if it's purely for yeah. education in that yeah. classroom, I don't think there's an issue because, I mean, you collect their homeworks with their names on it, you get them tests with mm -hmm. their names on it, you're yeah. constantly evaluating and crit critically evaluating their work uh, as long as you're not showing Jim what Joe got on the exam. And you, you mean, sociology classes have given out surveys in the past for you to fill out demographic. I mean, when I took sociology, I didn't fill it out. So this is just a paperless version of that survey. Okay. Yeah, because I never, I didn't even consider human subjects when I started doing it. So, so it came up. Have you ever used it to um, facilitate just quick a quick pair and share thing where you ask a question and they don't, a lot of the class doesn't know the answer right? So then you say talk to each other, and then see if they come back with a right answer after talking to each other. No, no, that's a good idea because I do, I, I, I would be set up for that in that I do give them um, leading questions that lead them to the wrong answer in order to like refresh the discussion. But I should let them pair and share. That would be a good idea. That's one way I've, I've heard of that being used, and that's one way of testing actually the effectiveness of it too. If you see that, oh, they do get a, the right answer the second time after talking to each other, then you're kind of proving the pairing and sharing that works. Okay. But you're also showing that the clickers have some effect too. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, yeah I don't know, Karen, you may have talked to the same person I talked to at the conference this This was in Davis, yeah. yeah. And it was a physics professor from Irvine. He said, he said when I ask that question, and it's like 50-50, so he thinks you know, half the class he does it. That's what he said. He gets them to talk to one another. He said, number one, boy, he's got the attention of those students because all of a sudden it's a very good chance that they're not one of the ones that got it right. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, he said that he gets them to talk and that starts you know, kind of collaboration and sharing. Yeah, that's a real simple but great idea. So right now, so if you buy them, well, right now through the, through the bookstore, since we're going to go with this as a campus-wide, um, to the students, they're I think they they priced them at forty six seventy, um, so right at forty five to fifty dollars, which I know is has been a stumbling block for a lot of people to want. To, to for they are, but, yeah. um, but I think if it becomes, I think if, if kind of your questions of, of is this useful, and it becomes useful and it gets into like if, if core one does buy into it, you sort of start to assume that the students have got it from their freshman year, so. They get into lower division classes, upper division classes can sort of assume that they have it. Um, then I think the students that I've talked to about these and about buying them, about the cost, they basically said, as long as we're going to use them, we don't mind paying. But if we're going to use them once and that's it, yeah. then they're not as excited. About it. I did think about the fact that how, you know, with the whole, um, once they get used to the technology, it, it sort of the luster wears off that if every class is using these, um, is it going to? Work as much, but I guess if it becomes, you know, part of just like another add-on to taking notes, and this is just something you do in a class, then it's probably a good thing. But we'll probably have to start thinking of how to use them a little better because uh, maybe it's what I've done is getting old with everybody doing it. And another thing is the the company does tear down, so if we have to buy more clickers 
if we get over like a thousand per year, the price goes down for the students. So, I mean, that's where they're, they're, this company, this is where they want to make their money, is so that they want to sell them to students. And our goal so, someday, just for my own edification, while you're in negotiations with them, if you could just mention that, remember five or six years ago when Professor Harmon asked you if he could have a free set because he's at a new university and if, he, and if they work out, it could be big for them. They didn't do it. Yeah. <laughs> well, they probably learned they don't need to do that. But they could have gotten it. We could have gotten it. They could have gotten it. Gotten it. <laughs> our, our, right. our other goal is since these are wireless, you put it in your computer, we're going to put one of those receivers in every room. Yeah. And you'll just plug your USB cable in your computer, so you walk in, plug in, and you're just ready to use. Chain it to the we'll desk. tell you what yeah. channel it's on, and yeah. you can tell the students. That. I mean, that's, a, that's our that's our goal. That's right? good. Um, but right now, we only bought ten receivers because we kind of wanted to see is you know, are people going to utilize it? Is it going to be worthwhile? But I think if people really find it worthwhile and need it, yeah, I remember I bought an extra receiver one because I have one at home and one at here, and because um, I got tired of forgetting it, and it was pretty pricey. Yeah, now they're 99, or at least with the price increase. Yeah. My question for you, I guess, is how much, how much different preparing your course? How much time did you have to put in thinking of things differently? Like, was this a course that you had taught one way before, and like you thought about integrating? Well, it well, actually, no. This was a, when I started from scratch, so it was pretty easy. Um, every lecture I've made up for the class, I've had these in mind. Um, I think for a first pass. Um, it wouldn't be too hard. You just you just take your old lectures and, and try to put some questions and some little activities into it. I, it would be it's pretty easy to integrate it. I don't think it's really changing the whole paradigm that much. I know I've had a few questions about that from faculty saying, you know, how much time investment am I going to have to put in by integrating this technology? So that's good to hear. I've got a good question. Um, is PowerPoint the only you know, presentation software that these work with? No. There are, they have what's called Turning Point Anywhere, I think is what it is. Uh, that is basically a standalone. So it basically that little bar that you saw at the top during Tom's presentation mm -hmm. appears on separately, like no matter okay. what you're in. Okay. And so there's actually another button that's for start polling, stop polling. So you can start asking questions and start and stop them on your own, and it'll collect the session data and let you save it. And that hasn't been updated in a bit. It works um, pretty well, and I know they have a beta version of the new one, and it should be coming out, I think, in the summer is what they said. Okay, but, so, there, but then there's no options to go, like in PowerPoint, where you can choose all the different... No, it, 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 when you get the it. results, like the graph or whatever, it's very plain Jane, like, here's your bar graph. So it's kind of like... Yeah, but you can use it in anything. So if you're like using AutoCAD or MATLAB or something and you want to work in that as opposed to working in PowerPoint, you can leave this turning point anywhere open and just ask the question ad hoc, basically. Any other questions? It's way past uh, 11.45, so. Oh, yeah, I have to a meeting. Yeah. He has a meeting to attend to. But well, thank you for coming. Um, do you mind people email you if they have follow-up no, questions? Not okay. At all. Uh, we're gonna try to put some articles that uh, are in Clicker on our website, like crt.esmerced.edu. So if you're interested in uh, reading up on this, uh, there are tons out there, and we'll try to link some of the key articles on there. Uh, we're gonna be in this room again in about three in three weeks exactly, and it's gonna be a presentation by um, Elliot Campbell. Uh, he's also part of engineering. He'll be doing a presentation on dim dim which is a very interesting new technology. Um, so uh, thanks for coming and enjoy your rest of the day.